Secure boot, measured boot, trusted boot. Oh my. Hi everybody. Today we're gonna to talk about a few topics that deal with device security and more or less how to achieve them. The main topic we'll talk about is uh, secure boot and how it relates to the rest of the boot process and, and how we get to uh, antivirus. So when we talk about uh, malware and, and attacks on a machine, we talk about antivirus, right? Uh, antivirus, however, loads after the operating system loads. How do we trust it? We all know about boot kits, root kits. Uh, we've heard of these things. And what those are, are uh, uh, bits of code that get injected before the operating system loads. And they could impersonate the operating system. They can make the operating system ignore certain things. In fact, they can disable or impersonate the antivirus for that matter. So when we get, by the time we get to the antivirus, we could have already left the, the barn door open and the horse has already gone and we don't even know it. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the boot process and the modern way to secure that. So before we get started, let's uh, get a, a few terms out there. Secure boot, what is that? Well, secure boot is part of uh, your machine's firmware, specifically the, uh, 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 the EUFI firmware that replaced the BIOS method for booting the machine, uh, booting the machine hardware. Uh, so in modern machines, this uh, EUFI is capable of performing this task called secure boot. And so what secure boot does when the machine boots up and uh, control is passed to the EUFI firmware, secure boot can take a look at every single component that loads up into the operating system or the operating system loader. And it can make sure that it's been signed properly, which is how we end up trusting our operating system in the first place. For In the first place. Uh, we'll also talk about bootloader. Uh, bootloader is um, the, the little bit of code that actually loads uh, the, uh, um, the other components that get us to the operating system and in, in windows and a lot of uh, how it uh, has worked for a while now is that the, the firmware, whatever it is, would, uh, the first thing it loads is a, a bootloader and a bootloader is a general thing that can transfer control to whatever you might have. You might have windows, you might have Linux. Uh, whatever and it and it uh, to, uh, to allow us to boot to these different things if we wanted to do dual boot or triple boot and the bootloader can actually uh, take on that task uh, the bootloader actually loads another intermediate intermediary uh, component called the OS loader and the OS loader is specific to an operating system Windows has an OS loader for instance so uh, uh, these things uh, all get loaded in turn and uh, the, uh, the, the secure boot is actually responsible for getting us pretty much all the way up to the operating system loader, uh, loading the operating system. Trusted boot. Well, uh, that's what takes over after secure boot. Uh, trusted boot is really becomes a responsibility of the bootloader and or the, the operating system loader. It starts where the where the secure boot ends. Uh, the trusted boot verifies that the operating system itself, and then all the drivers that are supposed to load while the the operating system is, uh, loads, are trusted. And actually, this is specific to Microsoft uh, drivers, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. There is something else that. Uh, checks the third party drivers. Measured boot. Well, all of this stuff is great, but we kind of want to verify that it all took place and that everything looks good. And maybe we want to uh, uh, tell that information to our system that determines whether machines get access to our resources or not. Well, that's where measured boot comes in. And measured boot is a way to, as you might suspect, measure all those things and make sure that they all look good 
uh, sign the result with something that can be trusted and then deliver that result uh, to whatever you might be delivering it to. And in our case, as with all things Office 365, we're going to be delivering those results to Intune, which can then uh, relay those results to Azure Active Directory, which can then take those results and make decisions about access based on that result. All right. So let's move on a little bit here. It's a nice little graphic uh, from Microsoft, uh, kind of give you an idea of how this looks. So from top to bottom uh, are how we, uh, we boot a system. And I'll go into a little bit more detail on a couple of these components. So the first thing that boots is the EUFI. The machine boots up. There is a, uh, a hardware boot loader, basically, that loads the, uh, the code in EUFI. Uh, at that point, uh, uh, the, the EUFI starts loading all the drivers that it might need to talk to hardware just to get to the point where the OS loader can load. So you see in here that happens fairly quickly and then we get into the trusted boot because the second the EUFI loads something else, its job is done. But this is all still part of measured boot. So the OS loader comes in, uh, it loads, and before that there's a boot loader, and then the OS loader, and then, uh, then the kernel gets loaded. This is a Windows itself. Windows loads some system drivers, some other files. Well, uh, 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 Trusted Boot actually makes sure that all the Windows drivers that are loading have been signed properly. And that's how all of this works. We, we trust signatures. And there's a root of trust for all of this. In, in uh, the case of Windows, it's a TPM chip that's on uh, Windows that, that allows us to get to the root of trust. So everything is signed. As, as it's loaded, we trust those, we, we test those signatures. Well, uh, you notice down here there is a ELAM driver, early launch anti-malware driver. Not quite a full-fledged anti malware. It's actually only got one job. Its one job is to test third-party driver signatures that are loading at boot time. So that driver hopefully is being updated consistently and, be, and being given the signatures for uh, all the third-party drivers. It just collects them all and uh, it takes care of that. Now, most times this is gonna be Windows Defender, and you can see I have Windows Defender down there in the bottom center, but it doesn't have to be. It could be a third party, uh, could be a third party uh, antivirus program. Now, this all goes into that measured boot, and we can measure all of these. All this information gets piled into the TPM chip, which then signs that information, passes it up to a, uh, uh, an attestation service that Microsoft actually hosts in the cloud. And all this is set up for you. Windows actually knows where it is all automatically right out of the box. And then uh, if it's been signed properly and everything looks okay, whatever the result might be, that attestation service can send it back down to Intune. And then that's where Intune can decide whether the machine is compliant or is not compliant. Now, one issue with this is if you're not using Defender for your antivirus, you won't get a result of that ELAM uh, 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 running process. You, you won't see the results from it. That's because Microsoft doesn't uh, provide that uh, as part of the trusted boot process. Doesn't mean it didn't happen. It just means they haven't put that in there for third-party antiviruses yet. So. Uh, if you look at the uh, health attestation report from Intune, which you can do, you might see that that's not that that's reporting a failure or not there. Uh, it's just a, a, a symptom of the fact that Microsoft doesn't measure third parties. It'll measure Defender though. All right. So after that, uh, the operating system is fully loaded, fully initialized, fully initialized, and then everything else runs and starts, including the anti-malware. So this is how we get to the anti-malware in a safe way. So we can trust what the anti-malware then tells us. And it tells us the system is safe. All right. Let's move on. So... Uh, a couple things I throw in here, you can go on your Windows machine and there's a couple of ways to see if Secure Boot is enabled. Now, Secure Boot is part of the EUFI. If you want to call it BIOS, you can. Technically, they don't use that term, but that's fine. 
Um, so Secure Boot gets turned on in there. You have to reboot the machine, obviously, to turn that on if it's off. But Windows will tell you if it's on a couple of different ways. You can go into System Information, or you can go into uh, Windows Security, click on the Start button, type in Windows Security, and this is what it'll look like if you click on the Device Security icon on the left. You see down at the bottom, Secure Boot uh, is on. On. It right. has a couple of other things in here depending on what other features on the BIOS might be turned down. We'll get to these maybe on another uh, video. So, going back to the boot components, uh, the EUFI firmware boots, first of all, that's technically called pre boot, that's a hardware boot. Then the boot manager uh, boots up. Again, this is a common boot manager, it doesn't have to boot Windows, it could boot anything, but it's the next thing that boots up. This is on a hidden uh, partition in Windows that uh, you don't see. You can see it in the disk manager. You'll see it's there, uh, but uh, 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 it's it's hidden and, and it doesn't get a drive letter. Uh, at that point, uh, it will find out that probably Windows is the only operating system that's on the machine, and so it will load the the uh, operating system loader, WinLoad EFI, which will in turn load the only operating system available to it, more than likely, which is NTOS kernel, which is Windows. All right, so I mentioned uh, Microsoft has an, uh, an attestation service. Let me move my face out of the way here. In the cloud, it's already there. Windows already actually already knows where it is. There's actually another service in the cloud, a Microsoft certificate uh, service that uh, we'll also use here that, again, Windows knows about. So all this stuff is built in there. Microsoft has spent some money doing this and some effort to provide this functionality right out of the box. They realized that, you know, for, for us to try and configure this manually, oh boy, it's probably never gonna happen. So they went ahead and took care of it for us. So um, I wanted to demonstrate or kind of go over how this information gets cobbled together and then used practically for us uh, in Microsoft's cloud in Intune and then again in the Azure Active Directory. So the, the device TPM key. Uh, device TPM, secure chip that's a uh, factory burned in, along with actually a uh, uh, a public-private key pair called an endorsement key. It comes in at the factory. Uh, the endorsement key has a private part and a public part, as all asymmetric keys do. The endorsement key, the private part, is never released uh, from the TPM chip. Only the public part is. This allows the TPM chip to sign things. Well, we could just use that, but uh, they, but but the powers that be decided there's some there's some privacy concerns in here that uh, if we sent the public key right from the chip that uh, you could glean a little bit too much information from that uh, a public key. So the decision was made, if we're going to use attestation, let's make another key that doesn't have uh, the, the specific to the machine and, and the chip and all that kind of stuff. So, and they call that the, uh, uh, the, AI, the AIK, AIK uh, key. So anyway, this is another public-private key pair on the chip. What happens is Windows contacts a Microsoft cloud service that does this all by itself, sends up uh, the public part of the, uh, the key and gets a certificate back from Microsoft. What's the machine going to do with that? Well, that's the certificate it's going to use to sign the results of the measured boot. Those results are going to go to a different service, the service I already talked about, the health attestation service that Microsoft also hosts in the cloud and that Windows also already knows about and knows where it is. All right, so a third bullet here, the TPM gathers boot information during the measured boot, which is all the stuff that I was just talking about. And it injects those measurements into the, these, what are called TPM registers, and just secure locations on the TPM chip. Then the device itself uses a uh, health attestation component, well, the CSP that's on the device, to gather those results, sign them with the AIK uh, certificate, and then it's going to present that to the health attestation service. So the results are sent to that service. They're actually sent through Intune as an intermediary to the service. And then uh, the service looks at it, makes sure it was signed properly with a key that it trusts. And then it sends the results back to Intune. Uh, next bullet down saying, 
hey, this device uh, uh, passed these things or, you know, whatever it says. Usually it'll tell it, here, here's the things that it passed. And then Intune gets those results and says, okay, well, based on that, I'm going to consider that device either compliant with my company's policies or not. We'll take a look at a compliance policy in a second and show you what you can set for that uh, in Intune. All right. Uh, and that's pretty much it over on the right. You see a little uh, picture of that, the health attestation part on the client. All the stuff on the left is uh, the client taking care of things. And we have that one little part in the bottom right, the mo remote health attestation service that gets the results and then sends Intune back the results. We don't just send the results to Intune because Intune itself doesn't uh, uh, interpret the signatures and make sure it's okay. The health attestation service does that. That's its job to make sure that the signatures are good. They came from a, a proper certificate authority. And then it just relays the results back to Intune. All right. I mentioned this here. There's a newer thing that we could be doing that, that looks great. Not every machine does it, though. You have to buy machines that are called secured core computers. Well, Microsoft makes them in, in Surface, not all of them. Uh, Lenovo other manufacturers, but you actually have to look and see, does it do the secured core thing? Well, what is this? This is kind of a better version of the process that I just described. Uh, it, uh, uh, it, it lets you do a few more things. It's, it's more trustworthy. It's actually uh, quicker. Uh, and uh, it's something that's already available. You have to purchase these machines and, and Microsoft has a component that they call a Windows Defender System Guard. That's really a series of components that checks for this extra uh, security. I'm not going to get into this too much. Maybe we'll do another uh, video on that. But uh, you, only certain hardware comes with this. Again, you configure it in a slightly different way. There's a little bit more to it uh, to configure. But uh, this is even better than the process I'm talking about. So we're kind of not quite there yet. Uh, in a typical company. Unless you've been purchasing these and you had an eye on it already, uh, you probably have most of your PCs which won't obey this anyway. So again, we'll talk about that in another video. All right, that's pretty much it for Secure Boot. We'll talk about, I'll show you a couple examples of how this gets reported into Intune and then maybe how we can use it in a conditional access policy. But I threw in a couple extra things here. Uh, credential protection. We're going to do another video here on credential protection uh, in uh, uh, cred something called Credential Guard. Credential Guard uh, is sort of connected to what we're talking about, um, but it, it has to do with the BIOS as well. You have to have virtualization installed. So I just kind of threw this in here as a teaser for another video that we'll do. We'll get dead get to that later on. But basically what Credential Guard does is uh, when a Windows machine uh, boots up and you log on to a domain, and it's mostly for domains, uh, you get uh, certain artifacts left on your machine to provide single sign-on to a, a machine if you've already been there once, right? Uh, NTLM credentials and also Kerberos credentials. Well, uh, if you ever heard of Mimikatz, and many, many of you uh, have, you can actually extract those uh, from the uh, local security authority or the LSAS process, and then you can replay them against something like a domain controller. So bottom line, if, if I'm on a user workstation and an admin ever sat down at that workstation and logged on, their credentials could be stuck in that cache and you could extract them and run those against the domain controller. Well, now you're a you're a domain admin if you play your cards right. So what Credential Guard does is it takes that stuff and sticks it into a uh, into the hypervisor, basically puts it into a virtual machine. Not a regular virtual machine that you can see, but it separates it out so that you cannot extract it very easily. And this virtualization of security actually can do a few more things uh, other than a Credential Guard. So we'll be getting into that in another video. but. Good thing to have turned on will keep your domain from getting taken over. And even though most of us are using mostly cloud now, almost everybody still has an on-premise domain that they're at least syncing stuff to the cloud from. Uh, and a lot of machines are still domain joined. All right, so let's take a look at some other stuff. I'm gonna get rid of this, my little presentation. Here's Intune. 
And uh, inside of Intune, I have uh, compliance policies. What's compliance? Com well, whatever you want it to be within the bounds of what's available for compliance. So uh, you can have compliance policies for Windows, for iOS, for Android, for Macintosh. Here's a typical Windows uh, compliance policy that I have. I assign this to users or devices in Intune, and then based on the checks, they are marked as compliant or non-compliant. What we're particularly interested in here, and you can take a look at this uh, on your own, in your own uh, test tenants, is this uh, uh, compliance settings here. I'm going to get into this. And in particular, I'm going to look at device health. This is what I'm talking about when I talk about device health attestation. There's three things right now that we can easily choose for device health. Uh, require bit locker, require secure boot, and require code integrity. Well, uh, secure boot's really the main one we're worried about here. Uh, we want to make sure that the device has boot has booted up in a secure fashion. So that's part of that measurement that gets reported to the health attestation service. So the health attestation service will come back and say, hey, this machine has secure boot on. Well, great, then Windows, then Intune would consider that uh, part of the compliance. If it says secure boot is not on, well, now Window, now Intune is definitely going to mark that machine as non-compliant. We have BitLocker in here already. Another good thing to have on, you always want BitLocker uh, uh, encrypting your drives. So BitLocker is another thing that gets uh, into the TPM uh, registers and uh, uh, when a machine boots up that is part of the trusted boot you know uh, part of the measurement process uh, is bit locker enabled during boot up now here's a weird thing pay attention to this if it's the first time you boot this machine up and then it does a bit locker encrypts the drive right at that point if your device phones home to intune and it, and it does all of its uh, uh a device health attestation it's going to report that BitLocker is not enabled. Why? Because this health stuff, this measured boot, is only done once when the machine boots up. So if the machine boots up, then it BitLockers a drive, it's not compliant. It's got to reboot again. Then that BitLocker measurement will be made correctly this time. It will be reported to the health attestation service, and then the, the device will come down as you know more likely compliant. So it's always a good idea if you're pushing uh, BitLocker out with Intune that you have the users reboot the machine. Now you might notice some of you, a lot of you notice something down here, and I'll just throw it in here real quick. Um, where is that thing? Require, yeah, require encryption. Not the same thing. This just looks to see if uh, the, looks at the uh, the, the uh, hard drive itself to see if there's encryption on it. Could be BitLocker, could be something else. It's a pretty good indication that it's uh, encrypted. Not a strong uh, an attestation as BitLocker though. Uh, so this one actually will work uh, uh, even when the sh after mach even after encryption is done when the machine is already booted up. This one will work just fine. So you could use this. It's a little step down below BitLocker for uh, as far as the attestation goes. Uh, BitLocker is a, a stronger attestation that for sure that drive is encrypted, but this one will prevent you from having to reboot the devices all the time. So if you're having trouble with that, it's not a bad way to go. You could also, as far as compliance go, give the machine some leeway and tell it, well, let's, let's give you a couple days to get compliant. That's part of a compliance policy as well. And we'll talk about compliance again uh, another time. All right, so that's pretty much it for a, a secure boot. Uh, secure boot's definitely something that you want on. Um, if you see that machines don't have secure boot, you got to have them reboot. Somebody's going to have to sit at that machine and turn secure boot on. And that can be a bit of a hassle. So it's best to do it right out of the box. Machines should be, should have secure boot on, especially anything with Windows uh, Pro on it, should have secure boot right from the factory. Uh, if they don't, then you're going to have to turn it on manually. It's not something you can remotely uh, accomplish very easily at all. Uh, so uh, uh, try and get it, make sure that it's being turned on right away so you don't have to do it later. All right, that's it for now. Stay safe on the internet and stay safe in Office 365.